Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DxO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today we are talking about SilverFX Pro specifically. We're going to be doing high fashion black and white. Anyway, we got some cool pictures of some cool looking people that we are going to take through SilverFX Pro and try and do some interesting things with. Uh, I do want to apologize for everybody who was obviously signed up for yesterday's. I had to move it to today. Uh, just to explain, slight medical emergency, one of my front teeth exploded and I had to get that fixed. And the only time the dentist could see me was yesterday at 8 a.m., which took me well past the webinar time. So I happily have a new tooth, but um, yeah, I couldn't do the webinar with a hole in my face. I sounded funny, I looked funny, it just, and it had to be fixed. So my apologies, I'm very glad that so many of you are able to reschedule for today. If you have, or if you do miss any of today's session, today's webinar, or if you just want to go back and watch any part of it again, about 24 hours after the end of this webinar, you will be getting a copy of it via email. You'll be getting a video in your email inbox. So be on the lookout for that. Um, let's see here. Any other housekeeping? Oh, if actually just make sure, make sure everybody can see and hear me fine. Just say a quick hello in the chat room. Make sure that everybody's seeing and hearing me. You should be seeing my screen as well right now. So let's just make sure that's all working. Um, and Joni's already saying you missed, uh, you can see me and you can hear me. That's awesome. Um, Colin says you missed the creative portrait webinar. Webinar. So I, I can't send you a link directly right now, um, Colin, who's asking about that. The you these will be uploaded to YouTube eventually. Um, I don't have any control over that. I don't work for DxO. In case you're wondering, um, I'm a freelancer. I don't have control over that, but I do know that that is the intention to get all these up there. I also know that this is August and. Paris is largely shut down. DX is a French company. So there's very few people in the office. I think that these will happen um, come the end of the month. That will those will all get uploaded. Uh, I'm also writing written tips around a lot of these videos that will get posted over the next few months. So it will show up on the blog there as well. Um, okay. Oops, let's see here. Anything else? Um, throughout this presentation, ask your questions whenever you like. If you haven't seen one of these with me before, I answer the questions as we go. I will be regularly jumping over to the chat room. So anything you want to know, drop it in there, and I will go back many times and try and answer those. And of course, at the end, we'll go back and try and catch up on any that I missed. And finally, last bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a website that has all the webinars listed, nickcollection.dxo.com slash webinars. For some reason, <laughs> I can ask to do with that vacation time. The last one listed on here already happened. So the future ones aren't on here for everybody that, not even this one's on here. For everybody who has signed up for one of these, you probably got an email from DXO about it. There are more coming. I've got, I think, four or five more of these this month. So be sure to register for those if you if you love this sort of thing. We're doing a lot of different education in here. Hopefully, if you're watching this not live, this website will be updated. You can go to the website to, ch to sign up for the other ones. Okay, let's get into this, shall we? Today, I'm going to be using Lightroom as the host. Throughout all these presentations, I keep using different apps as host apps. Of course, we're ultimately working in SilverFX or in the Nick collection. But if you are not a Adobe user, if you're not using Lightroom, specifically Lightroom CC, as we are today, don't worry about it. We're still going to get to, we're going to spending, be spending the majority of our time in the plugins themselves. But I do want to spend time talking about the host apps a little bit too. And in today's case, uh, it's, what's quite important about what we're doing in the host app, and it doesn't matter what host app at this point, it could be anything, is adjusting the image to prepare to send it to SilverFX Pro. We generally do not want to just send the image off as it came out of the camera. There's probably some adjusting that we want to do before we send it into the plugin. So we'll be talking about that today. Again, I will be using Lightroom CC, but no matter what tool you're using, it's going to be the same. The discussion I talk about exposure, retouching, and so on, it's all the same. We're working with three different photos today. I'm going to take three different approaches to getting into SilverFX Pro from Lightroom CC. And once we're in SilverFX Pro for each image, we're going to take a different, so a total of three different approaches to the black and white conversion. Uh, the As far as getting out of Lightroom, we're going to go as a edit in Photoshop, so we can do some additional work in Photoshop before sending to the plugin. We're going to do an edit from Lightroom um, opening as a smart object, and we'll talk about why that's important. And then we're going to do a straight on, just go straight into the plugin from Lightroom CC and talk about uh, primarily the disadvantage of doing that, but you'll see what that workflow is like. As far as the approaches, we're going to go for a kind of high contrast, um, high grain, black and white type of look for one of them. We're going to go for very traditional and clean black and white look for another. And then another one, we're going to go for a bit of a, a 
let's call it a, a vintage film old look type of a thing. So three different approaches to the black and white conversion. Again, starting here in Lightroom. I'm gonna take a quick look at the questions, see if there's anything urgent that has come up. Um, Greg Nicholson asking how you find the blog from the DxO website. So if we just go to dxo.com, there is a blog button right here. Click on the blog button and you will find a lot of articles in here mostly written by me actually most of these are my articles that are up here so i've been doing this for um, several months now so there's quite a few on there and there's a whole bunch more coming in there so be sure to check those out thank you for asking that okay into lightroom we shall go all right so these are the three photos uh, there's one of this girl here one of him and that one of her so kind of fashiony edgy different whatever the pictures of people obviously the subject matter is uh, is uh, not super important when it comes to this, but I am gonna be treating each photo to go along with the style of the photo. So this photo here, we're gonna start with this one. This is of Kenna, lovely model. She had this great look going on with the, the kind of very Gothic look, the black hair, um, this vintage dress. I shot her against this old barn. And my intention from the beginning with this photo was to make it black and white, which is kind of fun. The others, that wasn't the original intention, but this one I absolutely intended to. So we're gonna start with this one. You're looking at right now the original photo in Lightroom, no adjustments made to it at all. If we look closely at it, you can see that there's a little bit of retouching we're gonna need to do in here. Um, let's get into the develop module, shall we? There's a bit of retouching we're gonna need to do in here. Um, but basically the photo is pretty much okay as it is. There is the um, odd tilt to it. I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it's tilted. So let me just go to the adjusted version of this. Now what I've done in here is a fairly heavy amount of adjusting inside of Lightroom. Obviously I've straightened it, but if we look at her face in here, if we go zoom in close to her face and I look at the radial adjustments in here, you'll see that I have applied a negative texture to this. So the negative texture in Lightroom or Camera Raw, and this is in both Lightroom CC and Lightroom Classic, um, is a great tool for smoothing skin. Now, her skin certainly wasn't bad and she's young, but she had some spots on there and I've maybe retouched some of those manually. But the smoothing of the skin by using the negative texture slider is quite effective. Now I've kind of overdone it on this picture, but I've done that deliberately because of the overall look to this picture. I want this almost ghostly uh, ethereal look to this photo. So I've kind of taken it overboard. I, I think we can all agree that her skin is a little bit over smoothed, but again, this isn't meant for, as a traditional portrait. So I've kind of over smoothed it intentionally in there. And uh, so like I said, a little bit of retouching and so on. So let's, um, let's zoom out of this and take this thing into Lightroom. So I'm going to do this uh, this first one by sending it as a rendered file to be retouched in Lightroom. If I go here to the edit in, you'll see that there's multiple options. I can edit in Photoshop, which is what we're going to do. I can just go straight into the plugin, we'll do that later. And I can also open it as a smart object, which we'll do later as well. And make sure I only have the one image selected. Here we go. Um, I'm going to choose edit in Photoshop at this point, which means it's going to render from Lightroom as a TIFF file to open in Photoshop. Now, um, I already have the default settings set up in there. You can choose whether you want it to go as a TIFF or a PSD and, and other options in there. Um, but that is, that opened the original. Hold on one second, what just happened there? Let's go back into this, back to the edited one. Okay, that's the edited one. We get out of the adjustment mode here. And let's try this again. Edit in Photoshop. I was very curious. I was expecting the dialogue to come up and it didn't. And it's opening the raw file. What the heck is happening? It's not supposed to happen. It says it's a raw file, but it's got the retouching done to it. That is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. I just set this all up. Why in the world? It's not the raw file. This is not a smart object. Pardon me while I figure out what is going on here. What has just happened in here? Well, you are getting to experience in real time troubleshooting. There's the original. That is a raw file. There's the retouched one. Back to the library module. That is also a raw file. Okay. Um, oh, we may have to just go back to the original one. That is so weird. I'm just going to do a quick little quit of Lightroom and launch that opening. I've never seen that happen before. It is, just in case you're not quite sure what's going on there, it is opening the retouched version, but calling it a raw file and not opening it as a smart object. So that just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, cause it's kind of not actually possible. 
So let's try this one more time. There's the original. There's the edited version. Okay. Okay, we've got that right. And just yep, cropped. It's cropped. This is the this is the right one. Okay, right click, edit in, Photoshop. It's happening again. It's opening the raw. Well, I don't quite know what's going on there, but that's okay. We're going to move on. It's really just the only problem is that it says RW2 up there. I guess that's really the only issue. Um, okay. All right. We're just going to move on. So I have on here a partially retouched image. And one of the reasons for this specific image that I wanted to take this in rendered out as a TIFF file that's showing as an RW2 is because I want to do more retouching in Photoshop that is easier to do in Photoshop than it is in Lightroom. What I've given up by doing this process is I no longer have access to the original raw file, but I do of course still have access to the hopefully 16-bit TIFF. Hopefully that's what it's sent over. Let's double check that um, image mode. It is 16-bit. Okay, so I've got the file over here as I want. It's just the file extension is weird. Um, so I still have access to all the data, but it's just not a raw file. But again, this does make it easier for me to do some retouching. So if we look closely at her face, you see there's a bunch of stray hairs in front of her face. It's actually a wig that she's wearing and the hair is kind of all over the place. So I'm gonna fix that using this retouching tool here, the middle one, and just do a quick little bit of retouching. Let's go in a little bit closer and let's make this brush a little bit smaller in there. Oh, right, I am I'm going to temporarily make my mouse smaller again. I have it set to be big so that you guys can see it easily, but it messes with the brush size notice just to show you see how the brush size looks really big on there but when i adjust it it's smaller that's because i am artificially enhancing the size of the tool there we go so now now i'm seeing it normally i'll try to remember to go back to the bigger mouse in a minute um anyway so to do the retouching in here super simple hit a clone point a source point and just start dragging over and i'm just going to very quickly get rid of some of these hairs in here now i'm not going to do all of it and there's a reason for that other than the obvious you don't want to watch me do this all day long but let's just get rid of some of these here. Let's go down to the line there. There we go. Get rid of that one, get rid of that spot, get rid of some more here, and then we'll call it a day. I just need to get rid of some of these bigger ones because they are a little bit distracting and not particularly pleasant. Okay, I'm going to leave, deliberately leave these ones here, and we'll see why in a little bit. Okay, so I've just retouched this. Let's just say I think I'm done retouching. This is now not a smart object, right? Because I sent this over as a TIFF file. If I go into the plugin now, once I hit OK in the plugin, there will be no way to get back into the plugin, into SilverFX Pro or any of the Nick tools and readjust what I've done. So for me, the one of the main advantages of going through Photoshop is the ability to add a filter as a smart filter. And the way that you add a filter as a smart filter is first convert the object to a smart object. So if I right click on this object here and I say convert to smart object, all this is actually doing in Photoshop is embedding this photo into another file and then replacing that file in the layer stack. So now instead of a file, I have a file within a file. I can go back into this smart object and retouch this image at any time without the filter applied to it. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back in there later and get rid of some of those extra hairs just to show the workflow. But now that I've created this as a smart object, when I go to the filter stack and I choose, uh, where are we, Silver Effects Pro, it's actually going to pop up a thing that tells me, hey, we've detected this is a smart object, which means this is now a smart filter, which means I can go back in and edit it at any time. And there's that dialogue. It is, a, it is uh, the active layer is a smart object, now it's a smart filter. Okay, thank you very much. And you can, you can dismiss that dialogue. So it's super, super important for me to have this ability because it does allow me to go back in and change the filter at any time, which I think is a really important part of it. Okay, so let's uh, let's get a quick tour of the app, of the the plugin, the tool, the app itself. I I may refer to SilverFX Pro as an app because it really kind of is. It's like a miniature app that we have launched into. Um, I may call it a plugin. I may call it a filter. I may call it an app. But we are talking about SilverFX Pro in here. Let me give you a brief tour of this just in case you are new to SilverFX Pro. On the left hand side, you have the preset library, which shows all these different presets. Um, also called recipes in some of the filters, some of the plugins, um, all these different presets with different styles and so on, including the on Vogue ones, which are the new ones that are part of the Nick collection too. I've said this before, I'll say it again. One of the reasons that I really like presets 
uh, is because it allows you to learn how a tool works. And we're actually gonna see a little bit of that in today's presentation. I'm gonna load up a preset where I go, oh, this is interesting, why is this happening? And we're gonna kind of reverse engineer it to figure out why it is creating a certain effect. But uh, for now, we'll just uh, leave it at, there's a bunch of different presets in here. You can click on these to try different looks to your image. Now, whenever you load up a preset here, on the right-hand side, this is where all of your adjustments are. And all of these adjustments are, of course, uh, controlled by those presets or, or what we're looking at now is controlled by the presets. There is a stack of five different adjustments. Each one of these adjustments is always here. You can turn any one, the, any one of them on or off if you want to. And each one of these adjustments, of course, has a whole bunch of controls inside of it. Now, if you're familiar with some of the other plugins, for example, Color Effects Pro, Color Effects Pro works quite differently in that you have a series of filters over on the left-hand side that you add into the filter stack on the right. In Silver FX Pro, there aren't any filters to add. There's a series of adjustments that are always there. Again, you can disable some of them if you want to, but they're always there. They can't be reordered. This is the workflow. This is the filter stack, the adjustment stack that's in here. It's a permanent stack. And so a very different approach to how Silver FX Pro works. But of course, Silver FX Pro has tons of other filters in there that you uh, probably wouldn't want. There's probably like 100 things in there that you may not want all the time. So this, we have five, and this gives us access to everything. So that's how that works. Uh, another thing I wanna point out, so I've got uh, a preset loaded right now, this one called Dark Selenium. And if I hit the compare button up here, it goes back to the original, but notice that it is not showing me the original in color, it's showing me the original, original in black and white. And this is important because if you were in Color Effects Pro and you were doing a black and white conversion or Analog Effects Pro, another great example, and you're doing a black and white conversion in there, when you hit the compare button, you see the original color version. Because SilverFX Pro is all about black and white, what it's showing you when you hit that compare button is a base level black and white conversion. In fact, it is, if I go to the all presets here, the very first preset is just called neutral. If I select that one, that is the base conversion. It is a simple, no effects applied, black and white conversion on there. So if I hit the compare button now, we don't see anything happening because they're identical. But if I loaded up another one here, hit the compare, we're getting a before and after for, to that. Um, there's also two other ways to view your before and after. So we're looking at the single image view. When I hit compare, the whole image goes and it's a, a button you press and hold down. Or I can go to a split view here, which I can move the split point around. I can also make that uh, a horizontal or vertical split. Pardon me, whatever you'd like in there. And then there's a side by side, which is super handy as well. Um, a lot of people like working in the side by side. I usually don't just because it's obviously smaller at this point. I like to see the image large. So I will typically work in this way and I'll just hit the compare button when I want to do that. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's just start. Let's just add something in here. I'm going to go through some of the new presets, and at this point, let's hit the second reason that I really like presets, and that's for inspiration. Quite often, I'm looking at an image, and I know exactly what I want to do with it. But sometimes I'm looking at an image, and I'm going, I, I don't know. Let's have some fun. Let's see what's in here. And by going through the different presets and just clicking on all of them, maybe not all of them, but clicking on a bunch of them, you can get inspired. You can go, oh. Well, that's interesting. I, I hadn't thought about doing the image that way before, but now I've been inspired in that direction. So for this on its own, I love using presets. So here's one called Dark Glow. Okay, here's one called Dark Pop. Here's one called Dark Selenium. A lot of dark ones in here. Um, highlight Fade, you know, that's kind of cool, but you know, it doesn't really do anything for me. Intensifier, well, that's kind of neat in there. Um, more silver, it's got a more silvery look to it. Ominous fade, that's pretty cool. And again, it's just a way to get inspired, see what the filters can do, see what the plugin can do, see what all these different adjustments are, and um, and find something ultimately that you quite like. So I'm going to start off with one up here called Dark Selenium. I, I quite like this one in here. And I want to uh, let's just take a quick look over on the right hand side and see kind of what has gone into this image and going from the bottom up you have something called finishing adjustments film types color filter selective adjustments and global adjustments global is the of course the biggest the globalist one globalist and um, this is where I'm going to start. So looking at this photo, I dig the whole image. Um, it's maybe a little bit dark at this point. So, you know, I can take the brightness up and just in increase the brightness, but it's it's like happening everywhere, right? It's a bit bit too much. So what I really want, what I really like about this image, because she's so pale and the background is so dark and she's got this white vintage thing on. And as I said in the beginning, there's kind of this ghostly look to it. What I really want is for her skin to be really, really bright. So I'm going to set the brightness back to where it was around 20. 
And if you toggle this open, you'll see that both the brightness and the contrast have sub sliders to them that allow you to get really precise with your brightening and your contrast adjustments. So in this case, what I really wanna do is brighten just the brightest parts of the image. So if I go to the highlights and I drag the brightness up on that, you can see that her skin, just the brightest parts of her skin are what are getting enhanced in there. And that's that's exactly what I want. I want to have that really bright white skin without going in and brightening up the entire image. So opening this up to get into there gives us a lot of control over the individual ranges. See the midtones there, it's, it's too much. I don't want to do the midtones. The whole thing is brightening up too much of the shadows. Um, what I really just want is the highlights in there. So that's a really powerful way to adjust this. Now, you, this is similar to what you would do if you were uh, quite well versed in curves and you do have curves inside of here. However, the curves tool is relegated to the film types specifically. Now this does still apply to the whole image, but a lot of the curve profiles that are in here are designed to mimic certain film types. So if you're trying to mimic a specific film type, you might actually start with the film types, go through the presets and find something in there and then back up to the global adjustments. And we'll actually take that approach um, in a little bit, but I wanna continue to play with um, play with some of these. Now, if I go back into global adjustments, so there's the brightness, we played with that. We've got contrast, I like the contrast, but there's this one called structure. Now structure, is something you might already be familiar with. And it essentially is enhancing the micro contrast largely in the mid-tone areas. And if you would uh, enhance the structure on a textured wall, like for example, this wall behind her here, the barn doors, it can really make it look quite crisp and, and almost grungy if you take it all the way up. Um, and, and it can be fabulous. But where it's not fabulous is on skin. Structure on skin can be quite bad. Now remember, we've already done a negative texture which is a similar effect to structure, but in within Photoshop or Lightroom, texture and structure are actually two different things. Uh, but I've done the negative structure, negative texture to smooth out her skin. So by adding structure in here, I'm gonna be kind of bringing some of that back and I definitely don't want that to happen. So let's take a closer look at her face. I'm gonna zoom into 100% on here. And right now, we're seeing still nice smooth skin. We're seeing some nice grain in here. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, what is the structure actually doing? Well, here's the thing. The structure is kind of being hidden by the grain that is already added to the film type. So let me disable film type for now, just for a moment here. And now when I look at the structure, now we can start to see some weird things happening in her skin. So the structure has amplified what structure was left in her skin and it's not really working that for this photo that had been hidden by the grain but i don't want to be hiding something here i want to get rid of it so i'm just going to go back into the structure and get rid of it um I, if i take it up all the way just to show you like really amplify what it does you can see it's doing these really weird things to her face in there we definitely don't like that so i'm just going to take that back to zero so we're not adding any structure in there and then I'm not gonna be trying to hide anything. Now I am later on going to add some structure into specific parts of the image, but I don't wanna be adding it to the face. So this is one of those big kind of high level tips if you're working with portraits, working with fashion photography, anything like this, and you're starting with the presets, make sure that your presets not adding structure that you are then battling with later trying to get rid of. Uh, it's just, it's a good idea to jump into that global adjustment, look at the structure slider and make sure that it is not adding things that you don't want. Uh, let's see here. Let me a quick look in the Q&A. Carl's asking about CC or Classic. We are working in Classic today. Um, Real is also asking, do I use Lightroom CC or Classic? Personally, I use CC now. Um, I'm not using Classic anymore on a daily basis, but today's presentation, I am using Classic for those of you that are using Classic. One of the big, big differences, and I actually have an entire blog post on this on the DxO website. One of the big differences is that Lightroom CC does not give you the ability to send the image to Photoshop as a smart object. So what we're doing right now is identical in Lightroom CC because I just sent the rendered file into Lightroom, uh, into Photoshop to work with. The next photo that I work with, that one I'm gonna send as a smart object and that's something you can't do with Lightroom CC. But in the blog post, I've talked about a workaround. It's quite convoluted, it's multiple steps, but there is a workaround um, and you'll wanna look for that in the blog post on the DxO website if you are using Lightroom CC. Okay, uh, let's see here. Don says, in an earlier webinar, there was a button I could separate the speaker screen from the speaker on the demo screen. Oh, you're talking about, um, okay, you're talking about the DxO uh, sorry, the uh, go to webinar interface. 
the interface hasn't changed. I have no control over what you guys are seeing on the DxO. Uh, sorry, on the Go to Webinar interface, there are buttons in there to show just me, just the screen, or side by side. You'll have to find the interface controls to do that, but it is all there. Um, David pointing out, I did not send it as a smart object. That's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so um, let's see here. Something else. Call says, when you set texture to negative 100% on her face, doesn't that diminish the impact of her eyes? Wouldn't it be better to paint in the negative texture so the eyes are not affected? I think what I did in that photo, and I just didn't go that deep into it, is I brushed away the effect on her eyes. So in Lightroom, you can do that radial gradient, and then you can brush away the effect of that gradient. And I believe that I did that on her eyes a little bit. Um, although, I got to say, the texture thing is pretty good at just grabbing the larger areas and leaving the fine details alone. It's kind of a really awesome tool. Um, all right, and Karen's saying, how do I see the chat area? It is, it is, I see two things. I see one that's called chat and one that's called questions. I talk to you through the chat. I see what you say in the questions. So look for either one of those tabs on there. Okay, moving on. So we've got the smoothed out skin. I got rid of the structure in there, so that's good. So now we can move on. Um, I am going to also highlight something else down here. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see this thing that says loop and histogram. When you open this up, so the loop is just going to show you a close-up of the image. Um, if you're in the histogram mode, then you're seeing a histogram. But at the bottom of this, you see these row of numbers. These are the zone system. Now, this is incredibly, incredibly powerful. I'm going to only touch on this briefly today. I'm actually doing an entire session around the zone system, which I think is my last webinar. So if you really like the idea of taking your black and white to the whole next level, then you'll definitely want to watch that webinar. Um, today, we're only going to touch on it briefly. But to give you a little bit of education about the zone system, if you don't know anything about it, there is a great article on Wikipedia. I'm going to copy this URL and drop it into the chat. So there you go. Everybody should have that link now in your um, in your chat. This is a great article about the zone system and where I've scrolled to on this page, it explains what each zone is from zero being pure black to 10 being pure white and everything in between. Open this up, open this web page up, bookmark it, something to come back to later. Um, I am usually when doing black and white photos of people going to ensure that I do not bring the skin tone past zone seven here where it says very light skin, shadows and snow with acute side lighting. So again, you can take your time to read all this later. I usually won't go past that zone, but because this image I'm trying to get that ghostly look, I will allow it to go brighter, but I really don't want the skin tone. I certainly don't want it to hit zone 10, which is pure white. That's essentially blown out. Um, I might let it go into zone nine, but for the most part, I want to keep it a below zone nine. So with that said, let's go back into the plugin and you'll see down here the zones zero through 10. And as I roll over them, they highlight on the screen what is in that zone. The real power of this is that I can click on any one of those zones and it locks that highlighting on the screen. So if I click on zone seven, now as I work, I can see part of the screen that's in zones or part of the image that's in zone seven. If I, for example, took the brightness down on this, you can see where zone seven is moving to and so on. So I can keep an eye on that. It's kind of like having clipping, which you're familiar probably with highlight and shadow clipping. It's like having that, except that you can have the clipping indicator show up for any particular zone range. It's super, super, super powerful. And again, I'll go into this a lot more in the final webinar. Um, but for now, what I am going to do is I'm going to enable zones 10 and 9 just to make sure that I don't go past that point. And I can already see once I've enabled it that I, I have gone past that point, right? I've blown out her face just a little bit. It's just a little bit too bright in there. Now, all of this said, the zone system is super critical if you're going to print. If you're just looking at it on screen, a bit less important because what you see on screen is, is what you get. However, as we all know, everybody's screen is different. And so it still is a good idea to keep as your baseline the, um, the keep the highlights from getting blown out using the zone system because then you know it's still going to look good on anybody's screen. Unfortunately, you of course have essentially zero control over what other people see on their screens, but having a good solid baseline, just like working well with your clipping to make sure that you're not clipping your highlights or shadows, working with that baseline is generally a good idea. So I'm going to toggle this on and off a few times as we go throughout the, the uh, editing of this image, but for now I'm turning on zones nine and 10, and I can see that her um, face is a little bit blown out. Uh, 
face, we might end up coming back to that, but what is more blown out that I'm more concerned with is her blouse. Look over here on her shoulder on the right-hand side of the image, you see that is quite blown out as well as the hand on here. Now, if I take my brightness down, even if I take just the highlights down, by the time I get that out of range, I've lost some of that really punchy brightness to her face on there. So I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna undo to go back to that. And we're going to adjust the, um, the shirt, her blouse here, specifically individually using selective adjustments. So this brings us into the next control set here, selective adjustments. Oh, let me put my mouse back to big again. There we go, okay. Um, all right, so selective adjustments are control points. If you're not yet familiar with control points, let me give you a brief tour of how these work. You are probably familiar with brushing, dodging and burning using a brush, bright in this area, dark in that area, great. Uh, you're probably familiar with masking, going in with perhaps a lasso tool or something like that to go in and, or even a pen tool and very precisely mask out an area that you want to affect. Um, you might even be familiar with luminosity masking, which is a very complex way to build masks based off of the luminosity of an image. What you're doing with control points can most closely be associated to luminosity masks. We are creating a mask in real time that is based off of the brightness, and in the case of a color filter, also the color, but here we're black and white, so it really is just the brightness, the luminance of the area that we click on. So if I click on a really bright area of the image, the mask will be built off of areas in the image, pixels in the image that are of similar brightness. Now there is a, what I like to call a circle of influence. So if I just drop this in the middle of her face on here and start dragging this out, you see the circle there, the size of that circle is not a hard line to when the effect ends, but you're basically saying, <clears throat> pardon me, you're basically saying focus the, uh, the effect within that circle of range. But it's not just a radial gradient. It is not just apply it at 100% in the middle and fade out to zero at the edge of the circle. Absolutely not. It is building a mask. And to see the mask that it's building, you open up the control points here. There's the one I just added. And you click on this little mask button right here. And that shows you a mask view. So I'm going to turn off the um, zone system at this point because it's getting in the way of this. There we go. The zone system, by the way, let me just turn on 10 again. Um, you see it showing up there like really strong. That is not the zone of the image. It's the zone of what's on screen right now because I'm looking at a mask. I'm seeing that in zone 10. So if you're going to be working in the mask, you might want to disable that just because it can be a little, little disconcerting. Anyways, I drag this around. You'll see that I can affect just the brightest parts of her face or the darker parts of her face. And it's not like there's a pure on off. You see those shades of gray. Pure white is where the effect will be applied 100%. Pure black is where it will be applied 0%. Any shade of gray in between is a variance of that. So the darker the mask, like over here, the less it's going to be applied, the brighter the mask, the more it's going to be applied. So in her case, I want to adjust the, um, the shoulder on here. So I'm going to move this around until it really selects quite solidly that shoulder area that was being blown out. And if I make this bigger, you can see how it's expanding beyond there. Make it smaller, it can be a bit more isolating. And this is great because what it's doing is it's selecting the shoulder almost entirely, selecting a bit of this down here. It's also partially selecting her hand, which I do also want to darken a little bit, but I don't want to reduce completely. So this one adjustment might actually do everything for me. Then again, it might not, but we're going to find out. So I'll disable the mask so that we're no longer looking at the mask view. I'm going to turn my zones back on so we can see what is being blown out in here. And then within that control point, there are three adjustments by default. There's a brightness, a contrast, and a structure slider. If you click the little black triangle, it actually opens up to some more. You've got an amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and selective colorization adjustments in here. In this case, it is the brightness that I wanna take down. Um, the amplify whites actually might work as well by going negative and reducing that a little bit, um, but I'm just going to keep it simple in here. We're gonna focus on the brightness, and I'll take the brightness down. And I'm just gonna pull it down until all those little hash marks disappear because I don't want, I mean, you can leave a couple of them, but I really don't want to have um, that super bright shoulder on there. Now, if I go too far, we're starting to see a little bit of shadowing on her uh, shoulder there. And if we look closely here, we can actually see that I am not selected or clicked on the blouse, but I've actually clicked on her shoulder. So I'm going to move this a little bit over to make sure that it's actually just the blouse that's getting selected. And we can always preview the mask and see exactly what we've got in there. Again, let's hide the zone hashes so now it's probably a little bit better we can see we're, we're not getting her skin as much so now let's go and turn that off turn my zone hashes back on again and did i leave it on i did leave it on and actually that's great so it has reduced we've gotten rid of the hashing in there if i disable that temporarily you see it all coming back turn it back on and we've nicely reduced that and in fact it might be a little bit too much let's bring it back up 
back it back down a little bit and find that happy place where we are getting rid of the majority of those. And you can see that it has affected her hand largely as well, not completely. So I'm gonna go ahead and add another control point onto her hand on there. I'm gonna make it quite small. Now here's an interesting thing to understand about control points. When I first added that, let me just redo that. I'm gonna delete it. Notice I got some hashing on her hand that tells me that the hand is um, is a little bit still overexposed in those, in those spots where it's hashed. If I disable that control point that I've already added, then we see that gets a lot bigger, right? So the whole hand is brighter. Re-enable that. Most of the hand, well, the whole hand has gotten darker, but we still have some spots that are a bit too bright. So I'm gonna add another control point. But when I add this to it, immediately notice how the hand gets brighter. Click on that and the hand gets brighter. I haven't actually done anything to the control point, but the hand's brighter. Well, why is that? Okay, super important to understand that the control points are effectively doing battle with each other. Every control point wants to dominate its region. When you put two control points side by side, they are trying to cancel each other out, which is exceptionally powerful because it allows me to add a control point to an area and then add another to affect it and then add another control point to a, a nearby area to, to protect it. So because I've just added this control point and haven't done anything to it, effectively what I'm doing is I'm protecting the hand from this control point that's been added here. That's not what I want in this case. I actually do want it to be darker. So I'm going to bring the brightness back down and it gets us back to where we were. And then very quickly, I can go just a little bit more and boom, there we go. We've gotten rid of the hashes on our hand. And that ha we've done that without overall affecting her face. So if I toggle the both selective adjustments on and off, let's, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and leave that on on there. Turn that on and off. You can see quite dramatically how we have reduced the brightness of the shoulder of the hand, but her face is minimally affected. And I say minimal because it's not zero affected. One, of the, one or both of these masks has affected it a little bit, but that's just the nature of how those guys work. Okay, let me take a quick look at the Q&A. Well, I realize we're, this is moving a little more slowly than I expected today um, because we are already at 36 after the hour. Um, when you change the structure in global adjustments, this is Catherine asking, to smooth out her face, will her hair lose structure too? Uh, so in global adjustments, absolutely, absolutely, if you're doing it globally, which is why we get into the selective adjustments to take control of these things. Okay, let's do another selective adjustment. I want to brighten up her hair a little bit, and here we're going to see how the, the control points can kind of um, work for and against each other. So let's zoom in a little bit tighter here. Her hair, as you can see, is quite dark and blending into the background. Now, this is going to be a really tough area to isolate, but we're going to see what we can do. Um, I am going to, let's go ahead and, oop, no, not that, sorry. I'm going to add a control point onto her hair and enable that mask. And we can see that it is selecting largely the background in there as well. So let me reduce the size of this and let's see if I can get any isolation. And we can see a little bit of isolation here, right? There's a little bit of separation. Let me turn off those hashes. There's a little bit of separation here where the hairline is. So that's encouraging. This tells me that I might actually be able to isolate the hair. So let's add another control point there and now we can see the mask that's being built very effective we've got her hair and not the background okay i want another negative control point over her eye here um, i'm just going to option drag to to duplicate another existing one so that works so now let's try making this one a little bit bigger uh, nope that doesn't work so let's make it a little smaller and i'm going to option drag that to make a second one of those okay so i'm building up the mask in here i'm going to option drag another one of my off ones Make that a little bigger. Let's try this one as well. Can I get that kind of bokeh bokeh spot there? And we're we're getting somewhere, right? I mean, we are really doing a pretty good job of isolating her hair in there. So this is it's not going to be perfect, right? But we don't need it to be perfect. We need it to be just enough to actually see the difference in there. What we're looking for. The two areas here. Let's see if I can make this a little bigger. I'm trying to have not quite such a hot spot in there. Um, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of just dragging it around to see what you can get. That is probably going to be good enough. Both of these adjustments, I'm going to want to brighten, right? I haven't done anything to the images yet. We're just looking at the mask. I'm going to want to brighten them the same amount. Instead of going and adjusting one brightness and then the other, I can select both of these. Just hold down the shift key to select them both. And on the control panel of, uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, sure, the control panel for the control points, there's this little grouping button. I click that and they become a group where now any adjustment that I make is applied to both of them. So let's get out of the mask view in here and take my brightness up on her hair just a little bit. And you can see, 
what's happening there? We're brightening up our hair a little bit. Now I might want some more control points. Let's add another one of this group up to the top there. There we go. Yeah, that's working out pretty well. Let's zoom out of that a little bit. Maybe, uh, maybe we do a little bit more. Oops, that's the size. That's not what I wanted. Let's go back to the main one. There we go. A little bit more brightening on there. Here we go. There we go. Wrong one. That one. Come here, you. There we go. And we can just brighten it up a little bit. And it kind of works, right? It's subtle. It's subtle, but we're getting there. We're, we're getting somewhere out of it. I like it. Oop, too much. Back down a little bit. So it helps. It just helps to offset the hair a little bit. So I just show this to you to drive the point home about how powerful these control points can be. I could be a little bit more precise with this than I've been, but um, but you get the general idea. Let's do a little bit more with control points. I want to affect the structure of the uh, the wall behind or the door behind her. So I just click on there. Um, we're not even going to go into the masks. I'm just going to crank that structure up. Cool. Let's crank it up even more. Maybe brighten it up just a touch on there. Looking good. Let's drag another one over to here. Option drag that over, make that a little bit bigger. Structure's way up, brighten this up a little bit. Nice. Yeah, so we're getting there. We're getting some of that cool structure added into that. Okay, now let's move on to the next series of adjustments in here. Um, close that out. The next one is called color filter. If you've ever done black and white photography before, like especially film photography, you might remember, <laughs> you're old enough, um, that you could add color filters onto the camera. So we're talking film, camera, lens, glass filter, color filters to affect the tonality of the image. The way a color filter works is on a, for black and white is whatever color filter you put on, that color in the scene gets brighter. There's another article that I want to point you to because this is very interesting stuff in here. Uh, this website, photo, uh, photograph my ad, photography, Matt, photography, mad <laughs> pm anyway this website let me copy this link and drop it into the chat if you're not watching this live you're gonna have to pause it and just copy that url but let me paste this into the chat as well um really interesting article about how black and white uh photography is affected by color filter so encourage you to check this out for now what we're going to do is based off of that understanding that the colors that the filter is will get brighter i'm going to play with the color filters in here so her skin tone of course is kind of in that orangish yellowish reddish hue and if i click on these different ones in here these different color filters you can see how it's affecting her skin so there's off it's very subtle in here but red is brightening up her skin a little bit orange is brightening it up maybe not quite as much um yellow is actually affecting it about the same as orange orange is a pretty common color filter to use for skin tone it really tends to smooth things out looks it makes it look quite nice so and we're gonna go with that I like that. Okay, so we got that one on there. Um, and next up is film types. And remember, film types I turned off a while ago. So if I turn this back on right now, the image is going to change pretty dramatically. But pardon me. Now, this was intentional. Usually, be, usually you would leave your film types on while you're making these adjustments. Uh, I had it off so I could kind of play with all these things uninterrupted, unobstructed by the film types. But now that we're in here, let's see what is going on in film types. So in here, you have a series of preset film types that are meant to mimic real film. You've got your Ilford Pan Plus 50, Ilford Delta 100, you've got Agfa APX 400 and Kodak Tri-X 400 and a lot of different film stocks in here that if you ever shot film, you may actually look and feel familiar in here. Um, these are pretty cool, right? There's a lot of different fun ones to play with, but um, I'm gonna leave it at neutral and just take a look at some of the other settings that we have in here. You've got a grain setting, grain per pixel. Do I want to add grain into this? Remember we talked about wanting to make this one kind of a grungy, uh, not grungy, but a high contrast, black and white, high ISO picture. Adding grain in here is where this is going to come into play. So I currently have it set at 500. That was just the default for this uh, preset. 500 basically means no grain. It's notice that the, it's kind of weird because it's backwards, but notice it says grain per pixel. The highest number is effectively no visible grain. It's not adding anything to it. As I bring this down, I'll take it down all, almost all the way. Now it's at only 27 grain per pixel, so far fewer grain, which means the grain's bigger. And as you can see on the screen there, it becomes very, very grainy and chunky. So I want something that looks good in here, but isn't totally overdone, but I want that kind of high ISO look so I can adjust it and maybe I'll set it right about there. You can also adjust the hardness and the softness of that grain. If I go to hard, the difference between the black and the white points of the grain itself are more, it's more contrasty effectively. If I go soft, it's a more softer, less contrasty grain pattern. So you might wanna find the spot for that in there. So you just, you just gotta play with it and see what, see what works for you. Um, I'm gonna leave it right about there. Uh, levels and curves, again, this is levels and curves for the grain, uh, for the film 
response. This is basically trying to mimic film, how shadows and highlights were affected in particular film types. We've set it to neutral, but if you were to say, um, choose like an Ilford one in here, you'd see it darkens the shadows, brightens the highlights a little bit. We undo that. Um, let's try something else a bit more dramatic, maybe. Um, now I wanna find something that's like really, there, there, there's one that has clipped out our blacks um, and really pushed the highlights up high. So a lot of different approaches to this. Um, and it's all controlled through the levels and curves in there. You also have color sensitivity in here, so you can adjust the sensitivity of the film to particular colors in the scene, which is a great way to, let's say you're looking at a landscape and you want to make your greens brighter. There's the color filters that we looked at earlier, but this might give you a little bit more precise control over individuals. I want to make my blue sky darker and my green foliage brighter. You can adjust all of that through here, so very, very powerful as well. Um, and then under finishing adjustments, you've got tones that you can add. If you want to add a color tone over the image, you can do that in here. Let's zoom back out of the image. Um, you can add color tones to these. I'm just going to leave it at neutral. You've got vignetting controls in here, burning the edges controls. So let's say, for example, uh, I want to darken the bottom of this a little bit. Let's do that with the burn edges. I'm going to go to the bottom edge in here. And if I take the strength way up, you can see this dark edge that's happening at the bottom. I can make that bigger if I wanted to. Uh, make the transition between dark and light smoother or harsher. Uh, in this case, I'm going to bring it down quite small and just add a little bit of a darkening at the bottom in there. I think that looks pretty good. And then there's the borders. These image borders, you can see it's got this little white border that is being applied in here. It's just a bunch of different border types that you can do. I'm going to turn it off. I don't really want the border on there. And there we go. Maybe that darkening on the bottom is a little bit too much. Let's take that down here. Cool. And when you're done, you hit OK. And you're, you're back out of here and you're back into, in this case, Photoshop. Now, because I converted this to a smart object, remember I did that before I went into the plugin, this is now a smart filter. You can see here in the layer stack, it says smart filters. There's the filter. Remember that I did not retouch part of the hair on her face. Now, let's just say that at this point I go, oh my gosh, I forgot to retouch it. It's not that I can't retouch on this version of the image, but that might mess with my grain pattern. And I just, if I overlaid a texture on this, that would be in there, I wanna retouch that. So in this case, what I wanna do is retouch the original. So I double click on the smart object. It is going to open up the file, because remember it's a file within a file. And now when I look at her, I can see, look at her face, I can see we're back to the color one. There's the retouching that needs to happen. So let's just do a quick little um, retouching on here and get rid of those other hairs on there. So let's just clean that up super quick. Again, you're seeing a, a deliberately blown up cursor in there, so it's a little bit bigger than it should be. Um, this, I'm not doing a fantastic retouching job, obviously, but it's good enough for the presentation here. All right, so there we go. So I've done that, I hit save. It is saving this, it's actually a PSB file, um, not a PSD, it's a PSB doesn't really matter to you. It is just a file within a file. And once that's done, I can close this. I guess I have to wait for this to finish rendering out here. Um, I can close this, go back to the file that we were just working on, and we're going to see this photo now retouched with the hair gone. There we go, gone. Um, with the hair gone, with that black and white effect applied to it. And of course, if I want to go back into the black and white filter itself, I double click where it says SilverFX Pro, and that takes me in, and I can make adjustments here. So for example, I go, oh, you know, I just, um, I don't know, the let's say that bottom vignetting thing that I did was still a bit too strong. So let's go in here, bottom vignetting, there it is. And let's dial that back in size and strength a little bit, hit okay, and we're back again. So we have that ultimate flexibility, super, super, super important. Um, for me personally, at least the way that I like to work. So let's go ahead and, um, and send this back to Lightroom. So here we are, we've got the image. I just hit Command S to save it, Command W to close it. It'll close when it's done. And then we go back to Lightroom and sure enough, there's the photo in Lightroom. So you've got the uh, the original that I made a virtual copy of, the one that I had adjusted there, and then of course, this one. All right, let's move on to the next photo. We're gonna be working with this picture next. Let me take a quick look at the Q&A. And I'm realizing we may not have time to do the third image, um, but that's okay. It's not a whole lot new in there. Uh, Gerald says, when returning to silver effects from a smart object, are the control points also retained for re-editing? Absolutely. Those control points will all be there. Once again, a super good reason to do that. Okay, moving on. So this photo, um, let me, let's see here. Uh, yeah, let me reset the exposure on this one. This photo is, I would say, properly exposed. Uh, I know I'm going to take it into black and white. And 
because of that and because he's dark skinned, I don't want to end up in black and white, kind of losing a lot of the texture and detail in his skin in here. So what I'm going to do before I send it over to uh, to the plugin is I'm going to brighten the overall image a bit brighter than I really need it to be, but because that'll give me more data to play with in SilverFX Pro, which I can then pull back down again. I don't wanna be trying to boost up detail and shadows that I've already hidden. I'd rather start with detail in the highlights that I can pull back down. And this is just good advice when we are working with a darker image like this one is to kind of boost it up a little bit artificially so that you can pull it back in later. And of course, with a raw file on any good modern DSLR, you're gonna have tons of latitude to play with. When if I go in here and I take the exposure way up on here, it's technically all still looking good. We still have lots of detail in there. Obviously, it's really overexposed, um, but the raw file allows me to do that. So I'm going to bring it up a little bit, not a whole lot. I'm, I'm watching the histogram up here. I just want to get a little bit more uh, into the midtones in there. So let's say maybe right about there. And now I'm going to send this file off as off to Photoshop. And I'm going to do this one as a smart object. So this is what you can do with Lightroom CC. Sorry. What you can do with Lightroom Classic, what you cannot do with Lightroom CC without a massive pain in the took us workaround. But again, I've outlined that in a blog on the DXO website. Okay, I hit open a smart object. Now, it opens Photoshop. We can see that it is a smart object here because of that little icon. If I double click on this, it opens up the smart object. And because it came in as a raw smart object, I am now in camera raw. Whereas with the other photo, Remember the photo of the girl, when I opened that up as a smart object, we were just basically in the land of regular Photoshop because it was effectively a TIFF file, a rendered out pixel file. But this case, because it is a raw file, we're seeing the original raw. And look, there's the adjustment, the exposure adjustment that I made. There's the exposure adjustment that I had made inside of Lightroom. And if I want to make any further changes to it here, I can. Um, but we're, we'll just hit OK from here. All right. So I've done this. Now let's go ahead and apply the filter. Now here's something interesting. I'm going to go into the filter menu and choose Silver Effects Pro. And that is from the recently applied list in there, which is something that obviously you can do because I just did it. And in here, we are seeing, ooh, this didn't happen this time. Very interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. So backing up a little bit, um, that was not something I was in, expecting to show. When I was going through my, my demo this morning, I thought I discovered a new feature, um, but apparently not. I don't know why this happened before, but we're already seeing some anomalies in today's presentation. So when I did this earlier, by selecting that dropdown, it applied the same look that I had done to the previous photo, to the photo of the girl. And it even had the control points. And I thought, oh, that's really cool that it did that, but now I just did it and it didn't apply the control points. So I don't know. Um, this is what I expected. Pulling up this filter should not have applied the previous effect. I thought maybe this was a change in Photoshop because it did just update yesterday, but um, but apparently not. So never mind. You can select the filter from that previous menu or dig into the menu if you like. Okay, so for this one, I want to do a very simple, traditional, um, nice, clean black and white look to this one. So we're going to start with our neutral settings and just go through the adjustments here. Overall exposure looks good, but I'm going to start with the film types and I'm going to see if there's a film type in here that I really like, that I like the look of. And this is just great. It's awesome. We can just go through these and pick one that you think you might like in here. Um, now, there's one that I know I want to get, which is, which one did I decide? Oh, yes, Kodak Plus X, this one right here. So let's say I like this one, so I apply this. I think this looks really good. Um, it's darkening the image quite a bit, and we can see that if we do a side-by-side -side compare, it is darkening the image quite a bit. And this is a great example of going, you know, I love the overall look, but it's darkening it too much. Now, maybe I can go into the global adjustments and brighten it up a little bit, but um, but I would rather do this at the raw level. So here's what I'll do. I'll hit OK, apply this filter, and because it is a smart object, a smart filter on a smart object. I can go back into this, into the raw image, and now let's take the exposure up. We're gonna open up a full stop. Let's go plus one on there, hit okay. And we're going to see this image brighten up that half stop in there. And I'm waiting for that to happen. Let's see any questions while we're waiting for that. Um, question from Rafael, is it possible to create a control point based in a certain amount of luminosity in the image. Well, that is exactly what the control points are. Control points are based off the luminosity, not, you can't create a control point here and say based it off the luminosity here. It is based off of where you clicked. So maybe that was your question, but it's only based off of where you have clicked. Um, 
all right, let's see here. So now we're back into this. Uh, so that the image is now a little bit brighter. And of course, I can go back into SolarFX Pro and continue to edit this image. So we're going to do a couple of quick things with control points in here because uh, because I can. And then we're going to jump out of this one. So the shadow side of his face, overall, his face is a bit darker than his body. The shadow side of his face is a bit too dark. So let's go into selective adjustments with the control points, drop, drop one on the shadow side of his face bring up the brightness of that just a little bit on there. I'll add another control point behind his head and take the brightness down there. And notice here, I'm not even bothering to look at the masks. I'm just jumping in and doing it real quick. Like let's grab another control point uh, and add it down here to the field behind him. Darken that a little bit, nice, separating him out a little bit better. His jeans have this nice texture to them. Let's add a control point to his jeans and let's bring up the structure. Let's crank the structure way up on there. Now that's actually an interesting point. So the structure, on his jeans looks fantastic. And I told you you wanna be really careful of adding structure to skin because uh, because it can make it, well, not look nice. That is, okay, nothing's 100% rule, but that is a pretty solid rule when you're working with skin, primarily or especially, I should say, with women's skin tone. Women, you don't generally want to uh, add texture into the skin. On men, it's a bit different, especially if you have a picture of someone who's a bit grungy, maybe a bit dirty, like a farmhand or uh, maybe an older guy that's got a whole bunch of wrinkles in his face. In his face. And sometimes you, you want to enhance that because it looks really, really cool. So in this case, maybe that will work. So let me just turn off, temporarily turn off this control point. Over here, I've got my control points listed. If I click on this little checkbox here, it turns it off. I haven't deleted it, I've turned it off. And now let's go back into global adjustments and take the structure up overall and see what happens. And in this case, you know, it looks kind of cool, um, but I think I still prefer the look of him without all that structure in there. But I just, I do this to show that sometimes structure works. I mean, you see what it's doing to his hands. Imagine if he was older and you really wanted to amplify the wrinkles in his hands, that could look really cool. But in this case, let's not, let's go back, leave his skin nice and smooth and re-enable the structure over the jeans because I think that really did work quite well in there. Um, all right, that's it. That's all we're going to do in there. Hit apply. And now we've got a nice, clean black and white image. Isolating out certain areas that we want to make brighter or darker, really making him pop out of the background a little bit, brightening up the side of his face a touch, enhancing the structure on the jeans on there. If this is a jeans ad, a denim ad, you probably would want to really make those jeans pop. And by adding that structure, we've uh, we've quite nicely done that. Hit save, hit close, and we're going to be done in here. So now the next one, we've only got three minutes left of the schedule time. I don't mind going over a little bit. I know some of you may have to go. So I'll remind you that if you do have to go, um, you will get an email 24 hours after this ends with the, uh, with the link to watch the video. I am going to go very, very quickly, though, into this next one, um, specifically because I want to show you something that I've done inside of Lightroom itself. So here's the picture. Let's actually zoom back out real quick. So there's the full picture. Let's zoom in here. I've already done some work inside of Lightroom to this one, so we're not looking at the original here. I've done some curves work, lifted up shadows, done a lot of stuff in here actually. But one of the points that I want to show you is my sharpening is down to zero. Usually you wouldn't do that. Usually you're going to leave your sharpening at its default position. But watch if I double click on the sharpening, reset it to zero. Look at what's happened. I don't know how well this is translating through the oops through the go to webinar screen, but notice that it's kind of it's too sharp. Like there's there's pixels that are being kind of over amplified in here. This is a pretty high ISO image. And so it's really amplifying that noise that's in there. And I don't want that. Now I've also already added a little bit of grain to this image. If I take the grain back down to zero, we, even though our sharpening is at zero, we are still seeing some of that, um, some of that noise in there. And I don't like noise. I like grain, but I don't like noise. So for this particular photo, what I did was I brought the grain up just a little bit and just that little bit of grain hides the noise and grain looks way better than noise. And then by turning the sharpening off, I'm not amplifying the noise that's already there. So that's the important step that I've done in here. I don't wanna send a noisy image off to SilverFX Pro. I wanna send a clean image off to it. So now I'll go into my filters. Um, which is, well, there it is, uh, photo edit in. And this time I'm gonna just go straight into SilverFX Pro 2. So what this means is I am losing, so here I can choose what uh, how I wanna send the image. I'll do an Adobe RGB, leave it as a TIFF, off we go. Um, what I am losing by doing this is the ability to go back and re-edit the filter. So this is an unlikely way to work because again, for me personally, I like to have the flexibility to go back at any time. I don't care if it takes up more space on my hard drive. I want that flexibility. By doing what I'm about to do here, I am throwing away that flexibility. 
but sometimes maybe you just don't care. You just want to get in, do something and get out, and that's just fine. So let's uh, let's see here. I'm going to go into Vintage, start clicking on some presets in here, and there's lots of cool presets in here, um, lots of kind of funky ones. The main thing that I want to show you in here is, again, reverse engineering and looking for an effect. So this particular image has a couple things going on. First of all, there's a really, really strong vignette going on in here, and um, there's some weird stuff happening to her face in there. So the first thing I'll do to figure out what is happening where is individually toggle on and off these adjustments. Okay, so global adjustments. Okay, well, that's certainly brightening up the image. Um, but it's not accounting for the thing on her face and it's not accounting for the strong vignette. Selective adjustments, nope, nothing in there. Color filter, okay, that's affecting the brightness. Um, ooh, and that weird blotchy thing on her face is gone. That's interesting, okay. Uh, film types, nope, that's not doing the vignetting. Finishing adjustments, okay, well, the vignetting's and finishing adjustments, cool. All right, let's open that up and figure out where it actually is. So let's close all of these down. I look at this and it says vignetting is off. Oh, okay, so it's not vignetting. Toning is at seven, is it in the toning? No, it's not in there, okay. Um, burn edges, well, that's off. Image borders, oh, there's image borders, maybe it's there. Nope, that's just those borders in there. Well, that's weird. So where's that vignetting coming from? Well, I, I show this to you to make the point that just because this says it's off, that doesn't actually mean vignetting is off. All that means is that you haven't chosen one of these presets. If I open up the vignetting, you'll see that vignetting is actually applied. I, I would call this maybe a slightly not the greatest interface design right here. That probably shouldn't say off at this point, but I just do this to drive the point home that if you're trying to figure out where something is happening and it says off in there, it doesn't mean it's off. At this point now I can move the vignetting slider and I realize, oh, okay, that is where that's happening. So let's lighten it up a little bit. I can recenter the vignetting point on there. Let's kind of put it there a little bit um, and we're, go we're doing good. But now let's take a closer look at her face and we see this really weird thing happening on her forehead. And we did see when I was toggling these on and off earlier that that was coming from the color filter. What a strange place for that to come from. Why is that? Well, if I open this up, we've got these color filter presets in here, but if you open up details, you'll see the individual hues. And so if I go through and start moving the hue slider, you'll notice that that weird thing on her face gets stronger or lesser. So there's something in the original image, some color in the original image that is causing that to go all weird. So now that I know that, maybe I wanna choose a basic red or a basic orange or just get rid of it all together um, or you know, again, do it manually in there. Take the strength of that up a little bit, maybe play with that um, and find a good place for that where it doesn't have that weird effect. And let's say right about there. So I'm choosing, what is it? Some kind of a greenish, yellowish green, actually more like a blue green tone in there. And it just works for this image. Um, it doesn't really matter to me what the original color is, it just works for this image. So now that I've done that, I hit save and we are gonna be back into Lightroom. But again, this is not an editable image. And just to prove that point, here's the image. Let me right click on here and choose, uh, what I'm looking for, um, show in Finder. There's the image in the Finder. Let's open this in Photoshop. And sure enough, in Photoshop, it's not a smart object. It's not a smart filter. It's permanent. Now, with that said, what I can do in Lightroom is I can still add things to it in Lightroom. So let's say I decided I want to add a color tint to this. Um, I'm here in Lightroom. Let's go to split toning and let's add a color to the highlights. Let's add like a blue into the highlights and maybe reduce that down a little bit. And let's go into the shadows and add maybe like a red into the shadows and dial that back a little bit. So I can do other effects to this image in Lightroom, but I can't go back into the plugin and fix that. Okay, that is the end of the presentation. Well, only three minutes over, that wasn't too bad. Let's see what else is going on in the Q&A, and otherwise we're gonna wrap this thing up. Uh, Ra Rachel's asking, what's the name of your other webinar about the zone system, and where do you find it? Okay, <laughs> it's it's Ansel Adam, it's something about edit like Ansel Adams, something like that. It is, let me look at my calendar. It is not on the webinar website right now. Um, which I don't know why. Like I said, I think they're on vacation that just needs to get updated. Hopefully that'll happen soon. But um, I'm trying to find the date of this. It is the end of the month. It is August 31st. It is called Do It Like Ansel, Take Your Black and White Landscapes to the Next Level. And so that is where I'm gonna really be getting into the zone system. Uh, let me make sure there's not another zone. Uh, pre webinars preceding that one, Get the Look of Classic Film and Analog Effects Pro. Uh, on the 22nd, make the best of your architectural photographs. On the 20th, processing snowy landscapes in Color Effects Pro. So yeah, that last one, that, that Ansel Adams one is where I'm really gonna go into the zone system. Uh, as far as how you register for that one, let me see if I can do this. Maybe I can paste that into here. So you prob many of you registered for this 
via a um, shoot via a newsletter that you got from DXO. If you open up that newsletter, you'll find it. I'm trying to get to the URL. Um, if you open up the newsletter, you will find it in there. Um, but until then, what I'm trying to do is copy and paste from my iPad the link to that. Let me do this. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so that I can open my email. Um, so let's just pause on there and grab or open my calendar and grab that URL and then I'll paste it into the chat for you. Uh, let's see here. What did I say? August 31st, 31st, 31st. Here it is. There we go. This will work. All right. Copy into the chat. There you go. Okay. So I've just pasted that into the chat room. Now you have the link to register that particular uh, for that particular show. And um, that's that. Let's see if there are other questions in there. Thank you for asking that. I'm sorry. It's not a little bit easier. Um, call uh, Hall, sorry, says, is it better to choose film type before making other adjustments? I would say if your goal is to create a certain film look, then absolutely. If you're just looking for creative inspiration, then yeah, go for it. Try those out. If you are trying to make something that's just more neutral and you're not looking for a specific film look, then maybe you can do that later. Uh, it's kind of a back and forth. There's no easy answer to it. As you saw in the demo there, I turned it off to do the basic adjustments and then added the film kind of effect on top of that, which is a perfectly fine approach. But some of those film effects have so much contrast added to them that it is better to start with that and then make your adjustments before it. So there's no easy answer to it. Um, but if you know you want that film look, then I would say do that first and then adjust from there. Patrick, can you show, variation, show variations in contrast using control points? Um, show variations? Uh, I guess, sure. Um, let's go into this image and uh, no, that's not what I want. Is this the one that I did as a smart object? It is. So, um, so if I, well, this, this is the smart object one, right? Yeah, that was. Well, this is interesting. Someone is trying to, when I say edit in, Oh, here we go. Edit in Photoshop. Sorry, this is what I want. Edit in Photoshop. Um, edit original. That's what I want. So that's going to open the smart object layer. Uh, yep, there it is. So let's go back into that image. And you wanted to see contrast with control points. So where do I want to change the contrast on this photo? Um, let's, let's just say his skin. We'll do his, his whole torso. Let's play with contrast in there. So when you're adding, so in this case, I wanna add a control point that's gonna get as much of his torso as possible. So I'm gonna pick a mid-tone range. I don't wanna, I want, don't wanna pick the highlights. I don't wanna pick the shadows. I'm gonna go for something mid-tone in here. And as always, enable that control point will allow, or the mask view will allow me to see what is being affected in there. So see if I went for the highlights, it's gonna be quite isolated. If I go for the shadows, quite isolated, go for mid-tone in there, mid-range, and there we go, that's pretty good. Okay, so that's good. So now let's see what happens if I adjust the contrast. We'll take it all the way up. And that is really, again, it's affecting just that area, um, affecting the contrast in there. And you can see how the shadows have gotten darker, the highlights have gotten brighter in there. Um, and that could look really cool. Let's crank up some structure. It's like, now we're getting into some really stylized, hard image on there. Um, but yeah, so there you go. So there's contrast applied there. I hope that's what you were asking about. I'll leave that open in case it wasn't. Uh, Greg Nicholson, how to tell the difference between noise and grain? Interesting question. For me, let's go back to Lightroom. Let's go back to this original photo. There it is. And going to 100% on here. It's subtle. It is a subtle difference, but let's see here. I want to show, oops, that was right. I need that detail slider. Don't need that. Um, don't need basic. Where are we? I'm working on a low resolution screen to make it easier for you guys to see, and that does make it challenging to find things sometimes. Okay, there's effects with grain and there's detail with sharpening. Okay, let me turn grain off and sharpening on. I'm going to enhance the sharpening. Notice, and again, I don't know how well this is gonna translate on your screen because you're going through the internet. It's like, go to webinar is not the sharpest um, screen playback sharing tool in the world so maybe a little bit hard to see it but if you look at the pattern in here her forehead's a good place to look or actually here look up here under the light that's probably a little bit easier to see there's it's a random pattern but there's a harshness to it 
and a blockiness to it that to me screams digital noise. Let's go even more zoomed in. Let me zoom in farther. There we go. That Now we can really see it. See the individual pixels and how every, every block there is very harsh, very hard edged. That to me screams digital noise. Let's take the sharpening all the way down. And even with the sharpening off, I can see it a little bit. Now this is a pretty high ISO image, so we are seeing some noise in here. Uh, and so, yeah, so there's that. Now noise reduction is also off. If I bring up noise reduction on a little bit, it starts to smooth that out. But I try to avoid noise reduction if I can help it. I would rather mask the noise with grain, personal taste. So we're back to zero sharpening, zero noise reduction, and zero grain. So we can still see that digital noise in there. Now let me take the grain up a little bit, take it up to about 25 or so. And did it draw? I guess it did draw. Actually, let me take it up just even a tiny bit. Let's go, I'm gonna take it up just enough to start to see it in there. I'm gonna get to a point right about there. Yeah, it was about 25 or so. It's a good starting point where, pardon me, it has, not blurring is the wrong word. It's not blurring it, but it has obscured those square corners. Notice that you no longer see those sharp edges that scream noise. I, I have texture in there, and that's the grain, that is not revealing the noise. So it's a subtle texture in there. Let me zoom out, not zoom out to 100%. There we go. So now at 100%, we can see a very nice textured pattern here that is not noisy. Let's, is that making sense? I hope that makes sense. Let me, for at this point, let me take the grain all the way down to zero. We see the blockiness of that, take the sharpening back up and it really gets, um, really gets amplified. So that's noise and that's grain. And grain, hands down, looks better than noise. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Gloria, thank you for a very informative webinar. You're quite welcome. Other people saying excellent webinar. Glad you enjoyed it. You're welcome for the links, Rachel. Um, Joel says, quick one, can we, can we revision all the presentation later on and where will the video be? Okay. Can you revisit the presentation? Sorry. Um, you will get an email 24 hours from now with a link to this video so you can watch it again. If, uh, for some reason you don't see that or miss that or whatever, this will end up on the DxO YouTube channel eventually, uh, just not right away because it's August and France is basically closed. It's a French company. If you knew that. Fadi saying no voice. I think you must have lost audio, but nobody else is saying that, so I guess we're good. Um, Adrian says, bringing your, your last image of the young girl, it seems if you printed this shot, it will be muddy. Um, you referring to the color version or the black and white version of it? Well, yeah, that one would be a bit muddy. I mean, that was kind of the effect that I had gone for, and that was kind of vintagey old look. Um, let's go back to that here. And zoom out of it. Let me get rid of the color toning that I added in Lightroom. Uh, open up the, where was it? Split toning. Let's get rid of that. Set, oops, set that back down to nothing. There it is. Uh, muddy. Yeah, it'd be a little bit muddy, but that's, you know, it's kind of the vintage look I was going for in here. This wasn't, you know, remember this one wasn't meant to be like some kind of super accurate image. Um, Raphael, I think it would be interesting if that control point could be made based on a certain value of the zone system. Oh, interesting. Select the range of the zone. Oh, I like that. I like that. That would be neat. Select everything in zone eight. Build a mask off of that. I like it. That's a good. That's good feedback, Rafael. Um, I would highly recommend that you provide that feedback to DxO. Um, remember, I don't work for DxO. I'm not an engineer for sure, so I can't really do much with that. But I like the idea. So yeah, submit that. Uh, there's feature feedback. I think on the website there's a contact page. Uh, I like it. You tell them that I said I like it. Tell them Photo Joseph said this is a brilliant idea. Maybe they'll listen then. Uh, Joni, so appreciating the fine tuning you showed in this video. Excellent. I'm glad you like that. I'll be taking my images to a new level. Awesome. Love to hear that. Um, excellent. Makes sense. Thanks. This has been wonderful. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for enjoying that. Um, I really appreciate all of you tuning in today. That was fantastic. Uh, again, apologies for the change in date on there, but um, I couldn't do this presentation with a hole in my face, so we got that fixed up. All right, guys. Thanks a bunch. Uh, don't forget, follow me on social media. I'm Photo Joseph everywhere, including on YouTube. I got a YouTube channel there with a ton of other education. Go check that out. And if you have any questions about what you saw today that you didn't get to ask here, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, at Photo Joseph. Just tweet me the question, and I will do my best to answer it for you. Take care of yourselves, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.